Uh, welcome out to Movement Church. My name is Josh, if we haven't had the chance to meet. And I uh, hope you were here last week for Easter. It was really exciting getting to uh, just celebrate what Jesus has done for us and then even getting to celebrate that through uh, a few people taking a step of baptism and to see uh, a lot of young people and adults too uh, uh, take that step. So um, it was just really inspiring. And if that's something you're still maybe trying to navigate, is that a step God's calling me to take? Uh, we would love to help you explore that. We're going to be starting a new series today as we're uh, kind of jumping into this next season through the book of Exodus. And the way I like to describe the book of Exodus is it's kind of like the sequel to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, right? And uh, maybe you're thinking, man, I don't know a lot about Genesis, or why are we jumping into the sequel? It's kind of like Star Wars, okay? And you can watch A New Hope, and actually, I would say you could enjoy Star Wars better if you don't watch the first three movies. So this is kind of what you're like. You're going into to episode four, but you're actually starting right where you need to start, okay? And, and there is a little bit of backstory. If you opened up your book, uh, your Bible to Exodus, you're gonna kind of get that, uh, that part of Star Wars where it starts to like scroll up and it's like, here's the context. Here's, here's what's going on in the empire, you know, and you kind of get all that going. And uh, what you see, actually what uh, Exodus was originally called, uh, the Hebrew word for it was Shemot. And it just means names. And so when you open up Exodus, it's like, these are the names of the sons of of, of Jacob, right? And, and what we're picking up on is there's this family. There's this family uh, that we've been tracking through the book of Genesis uh, that started with Abraham. And God called Abraham and kind of gave him this, this big promise that, that we're waiting to see God fulfill about how he was going to bless the world through this one family. He wasn't just, just gonna bless like one guy, but he was gonna bless the world through that one family. And so we're kind of like waiting, like how's the world gonna get back to where it's supposed to be? And, and we're tracking and tracking and tracking. And uh, you, you see this family eventually move to Egypt. And, and this, this family grows bigger over time. That we call them the nation of Israel, just as we're, we're tracking that family line. And really what happens is this family grows to be so big, uh, the Pharaoh ruling over Egypt at the time becomes afraid and become, becomes fearful of just uh, this nation that has began to grow right under, uh, right in their backyard. And what started as a friendly relationship and, and a welcome in, into Egypt turns into an oppression of those people. And so about 300 years go by between basically their arrival uh, in Egypt to when we're picking up in the story of Moses. So Moses comes through this uh, family line. He is born an Israelite. And uh, when he is born, basically th there's a threat on all the uh, Israelite baby boys uh, because of a royal order that Pharaoh has in place to execute them. And so his mom puts him in a basket uh, in the Nile River and Pharaoh's daughter finds him and adopts him and raises Moses in uh, the royal household. And so that's kind of Moses's background. He comes, he's, he's born as a, an Israelite, but he's raised as Egyptian royalty. And 40 years later, um, Moses tries to defend a fellow Israelite and he ends up murdering uh, an Egyptian. And basically this becomes his scarlet letter. He ends up running for his life. Um, he flees to an area called Midian. It's like 400 miles away. So if you did something dumb and you were like, I'm gonna move to Milwaukee, that's what this is like. You're like, I'm going to Milwaukee. I'm getting out of Columbus. I can't be seen around here anymore. And you, you start all over. And so Moses at 40 years old uh, uh, flees. He uh, starts a family. Um, he ends up working for his father-in-law whose name's Jethro. He takes care of sheep. And, and he has a life out there for another 40 years. And basically that's where we're gonna pick it up. Like Moses is 80 years old. The first half of his life has been, uh, I guess I'd say the first third of his life has been spent in Egypt as a born Israelite raised by Egyptians. And then the second third of his life has been in Midian, just in like the wilderness, working for his father-in-law, starting a family, tending sheep, and living in obscurity. And, and what's gonna be fascinating is, is the rest of the book of Exodus that we're gonna explore over the next couple weeks is the last third of his life. And you really just get to, to journey with this character. You get to see God really do one of the most miraculous and significant forms of rescue 
that, that we see in the whole Bible. Besides Jesus and the cross, like what we celebrated last week, there are so many parallels between like the way Jesus rescues us and the way that Moses and, and, and how God works through him rescues the people of Israel out of Egypt. And, and so we're, we're really tracking this, this message of freedom of, of calling, of deliverance, of rescue, um, the miraculous happening, even just his call to leadership. And I think that's what makes Moses, he ends up just being one of the most important characters in the Bible. You, you see him walk so close with God where he's actually talking to him. He's having to really implement God's plan with people who don't always want to uh, go along with what God's calling them to. Just all the challenge and difficulty of that. And so today what we're gonna specifically do is just talk about Moses calling from God and how he's been running from something, but God's gonna begin to ask him to run toward something. And I think that you're gonna see and maybe even relate to Moses' initial fear in that and how uh, God's inviting him to, to uh, be part of this, but He's very hesitant. And so um, kind of our path for today, what we're gonna do is I just wanna give us uh, an intro, like a, kind of like a lesson in uh, calling. I think that there's something we can pull out of, of Moses. I think I actually relate to a lot in my story and maybe it'll connect to some of us. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna unpack the fears that Moses has in saying yes to that calling because he is a bunch of them. <laughs> and so whether you have all of them or just one of them, I think that we can kind of see how he brings that to God and how God responds to him. And then lastly, what we'll do is we'll unpack just how Jesus calls us, all right? Because I'm not Moses, you're not Moses. But what we're, I think why we're here today is we're trying to respond to Jesus. How would he call me in my life? And uh, how would I deal with maybe some of the hesitations or uh, fears that, that I'm dealing with? And so we're gonna be in Exodus three and four. Uh, if you wanna open that up on your phone or there's some Bibles in the chairs right in front of you, that's on page 36. And I would say, keep it open because uh, there's, there's a lot here and we're gonna kind of, jump in and out of it, especially as we explore some of Moses's and God's interaction. And uh, again, we've covered that backstory and we're picking up when Moses is 80 years old, a normal <laughs> everyday experience of taking the sheep around in, in the wilderness, letting them eat and, and hanging out. This is what it says in uh, verses one through 10. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And God saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers and I'm concerned about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now the cry of Israel has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So you, Moses, now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So you can put your, your finger there and, and we'll come back to it here in a minute. God is calling Moses. How many of you would, would say you've felt a call to something before in your life? I'm actually asking you to raise your hands. I just wanna say, is this, okay, good. This isn't just something I felt one time or Moses felt. There's people in the room who can relate to that. Maybe there's something in you that like you were feeling pulled to something, right? Um, or or maybe, maybe something was happening outside of you. You're kind of being pushed toward it. Like just something felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. This is for me. Does anyone else feel this? And it's like, no, it's you. Like you're being called to this. And, and maybe that comes at a time in your life where it's a really 
pivotal moment. You end up looking back at your story and like, that was like, I was at kind of a crossroads and, and how, I, mean, I don't know how many of you raised hands. You say, maybe God was doing that. And he intervened at that crossroads in my life. And he was doing all this stuff, maybe preparing me or pushing me or pulling me towards something. I can look at my own life and I, I can see several times where, where God did something like that. When I was a teenager, I remember I was, I was super into music. I was a drummer and I ended up just Every opportunity I could take to play drums, I, I would uh, uh, jump into. And I remember going to this youth conference where I played drums at, and that was the moment where I feel like God called me to himself, where I stopped kind of just living selfishly and kind of seeing the world through my own eyes, and he, he called me to himself. And shortly after that, I felt a call uh, to invest my life to become a pastor. And then that, that was shortly after that. I remember after being in college for a little bit and having the opportunity of where I was gonna go and work and what we were getting, we were getting married, we felt called to move to Wisconsin, <laughs> a little bit further past Milwaukee, all right? And we were up there and, and we, we had jobs up there and, and I was working at a church. And then we felt a call to come to Akron and, and we were there for eight years and that's where we started our family and, and saw God work in a, a ton of ways there. And, and finally, just in this last year or two, feeling a calling to come to Columbus, and do church planning. And so I can look at, at all these patterns in my life in ways that God like showed up and I was at a crossroads and I felt like, I don't think I can do this anymore, but I do feel really called to this. And, and if you've ever had an experience like that, um, you know what that's like, but maybe if you haven't, and you're like, would God ever work that way in my life? Here's what I want you to know about calling. It's, it's a pattern I think that, that I experienced and we look at Moses here, is that God's calling becomes most clear when we stop and pay attention when we stop and pay attention. What, what happens with Moses is he's doing something where he, he punched the clock every day for 40 years. So many, just, you know, there's a bush over there and something's different about it. Something in, in his ordinary mundane life is different and he notices it. And, and he goes over, I'm gonna go explore what the thing is. God interrupts his, his ordinary everyday life and begins to, to create something holy, something sacred. He pays attention to God and he notices this burning bush and, and that's where he discovers uh, this calling that God has for him. And I think, including myself, many of us, it's really hard to have enough margin in your life to pay that much attention to God. That, that life is the pace of life and the complexity of life. Uh, honestly leaves a limited amount of room for God to work. Like our, our days are booked, we've got sports practice and we gotta wake up early and there's a breakfast meeting and, and there's bills to pay and taxes to get done and it's just, it's packed full. And I think that sometimes, it, even if God was trying his hardest to get our attention, we maybe wouldn't notice it. But for the person who wants to, to learn to pay attention uh, and learning what to pay attention to, it's gonna be crucial it's that we learn to do that if we want to know what God's calling is on our life. Each time in my story, I kind of shared a few different pivotal moments. Each time, I, I could probably talk all morning about how I had to stop and kind of draw back and, and kind of create some space to seek God and to kind of hear him again. And sometimes that was like a moment where I, I was paying attention to him and he did something. And sometimes that was like a year of waiting and waiting and showing up and be like, okay, God, I'm not gonna move too quick before you make it clear what you're up to. It, it isn't always just a, a moment, but I think that um, sometimes there's something already burning inside of us. And, and, and I feel like it, it comes to this point where it's actually already been in you, but we've been so hurried and distracted that you're like, I haven't actually given attention to something that's a deep passion of mine, something that I felt called to for a while. Maybe I've become numb to it. Life has just been mundane. And because I've stopped looking for God, it's gotten quiet. I'm not familiar with my calling or God's voice. And so if you want to discern better the things or the thing that God might be calling you to, I think we have to learn to pay attention. And Moses, even though he has this incredible moment, he's interacting with God, he's hesitant. He's incredibly hesitant because he actually doesn't know God. And he, and he has all this baggage from his past. And we're, we're gonna unpack that, but it, it makes sense that 
God's calling is incredibly relational and personal to you. It, it involves your story and it involves trusting him in ways that probably you're not familiar with or feel risky and unfamiliar. And, and of course there's gonna be fear. He's trying to take you somewhere you don't know yet. And it takes a profound amount of trust to say yes to him. And so that's why I wanna sit on, on some of the, the fears that Moses has. Because I think if we're willing to pay attention, we begin to hear, okay, maybe God's put this longing in me so that I might do this, or maybe it's finally time for our family to, or, or maybe what I'm actually supposed to do is this. You're going to begin to recognize your hesitant as well. And so we're gonna walk through these four fears. I open back up your, your Bibles there to Exodus 3, and, and we're gonna walk through the first one. It's just in verses 11 through 12. So go to Egypt, Moses. I'm gonna lead my people out of Egypt because of you. And this is what Moses says. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this very mountain. Who am I? <laughs> that's, that's Moses' first response is what he thinks about himself, right? What we think about ourselves is incredibly important. Like the, the narratives we write for ourselves affect every part of our lives and nothing will confuse calling more than an identity crisis. So many things about ourselves that we feel are inadequate or inferior or unusable, whether that's our story or our mistakes or our abilities or our lack of ability. And, and our inadequacies can leave us reeling and questioning like, who are we? Like, I don't, I don't know who I am. How would I know how to respond to what God's calling me to? And, and maybe you've been stuck in a place where you felt like, I don't really know who I am anymore. And things feel blurry. They, they feel foggy and unclear and, and like you're lost and disillusioned. And I think what's important to see how God responds to this, that, that feeling of I'm not good enough. I don't know who I am and how he can uh, speak into the, those identity issues. Two years ago, uh, early on, when we were feeling called to plant a church, I, I felt the I'm not good enough fear. Actually, I, I remember um, we had wanted to do something like that for about 10 years, but you know, just after time and having kids, I, I kind of lost and forgot that passion. And I remember that I felt like lost in who I was, and, and, but God was starting to bring this dream back alive and I didn't quite know what to do with it because I, I felt so inadequate. And I remember one night I couldn't sleep and I, I got up in the middle of the night, it was probably like 3 a.m. and I went downstairs and I opened up my Bible and usually what I do when I don't know what to do in my Bible is I just go to the Psalms because it's, it's kind of prayer language, it's talking to God language. And I got to Psalm 90 and this is what it says. It says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm 90 is the only Psalm that Moses wrote. Um, and I don't think it's any surprise that this is the wisdom that Moses picked up on as he navigated his own calling. And I remember kind of like talking to God and I went and grabbed a piece of construction paper from my kids like little uh, drawing table because <laughs> that's all I had. And this is what I wrote down. I wrote down, the Lord has made it evident to me again that I live my days for him alone. My calling is from him alone and with him alone when all else fails or doesn't make sense. I believe one day God will fulfill a decade long dream that we have had to plant and lead a church. But I fear that if I continue to numb my heart, it will destroy me and cause me to forget my calling again. God never asked me to suppress this dream but I gave into living in fear, trying to avoid risk and looking to receive my affirmation somewhere in some way other than God himself. And, and this piece of paper um, I've kept around because it was, it was actually in a really weak moment where God's starting, reminded me, hey, hold on. You, you're thinking all the ways of how you're not good enough to accomplish that dream, but you're forgetting that I'm going to go with you. 
And, and it wouldn't be till a couple years later after writing that down that we moved here. But the problem wasn't that I wasn't good enough or that, that wasn't the determining factor of if it was gonna happen or not. The problem was that I had really numbed myself to the voice of God, to, to a, long, a good longing he had given me and wasn't trusting the reality of him to be with me to make it happen. And I think that God's willingness to be with us in any given task is the most important thing. That's kind of like what I walked away from that moment. I was like, okay, if God wants to do this, then it's gonna happen. And if he doesn't, there's really nothing I can do to, to force it to happen. I don't know if you've ever navigated that. Like there's something in you and you don't quite know if it's of God yet or like if, if it's healthy or if it's good or if it's gonna come to fruition. And there's a part of that you're like kind of waiting and you can trust that if, if God's in it, he's gonna make it happen. He's that involved in your life. He cares that much about you and about furthering his kingdom and his story. The second fear that Moses has is in verse 13. Moses says to God next, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Okay, so Moses grew up ethnically as an Israelite, but he was raised by Egyptians. And so Moses had been out of the family for a while. Right? He didn't, he didn't like uh, know all the family meals that they ate. He didn't know like all the traditional songs. He, he grew up as an Egyptian. So he probably had a little bit of, of feeling a displacement of like, I know this is who I am, but I don't really like fit in. And maybe some people would have looked at Moses and said, like, you never fit in. Like, you're not really one of us. And so he has this fear of, I, I don't know enough. I don't, I don't know enough about who you are, God, and, and what Israel is and what your promises are. And like, I just... I'm like the most unqualified person to do this. They, they might call me out, they might quiz me. I don't even know your name, God. And what's so fascinating about what Moses asks God is not just like, what's your name again? It, would, it wouldn't be the way we talk about like, oh, my name's Josh and that's Ethan. Like what, what we're asking, uh, what he's asking God is, who are you known as? What defines you? It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of a more existential question of, of, of what makes you, you, God. And what God responds is he says, I am. That's all it means. It's just like this weird verb, aya, that means I am. I am who I am. You're like, oh, okay, what, what's that all about? All, all that means is God saying, what's most true about me is that whatever I am, I will always be that. So we'll get to this later in Exodus at some point, I hope we do, but God at one point will describe what he's like. And he'll say that he's gracious, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger, he's abounding in love and faithfulness, he's forgiving, he's just. And so all, all those things that describe God, what he's saying in this statement is, I am those things all the time, 24 seven, consistent, no facade. This is who I am, I am who I am. And so uh, maybe you know this or not, but uh, we'll often say that God's personal name is Yahweh. That's what we, we see here in the Lord in verse 15. It's really close. Yahweh is basically the way of saying he is. So when God talks about himself, he says, I am. And when we talk about it, we say, he is. And that's what Yahweh means. And it's, it's just a consistent reminder of like, he's unchanging, like everything that he says he is, is constant, he's trustworthy, he is dependable. He just is, you can rely on him. And God's point, when, when Moses is saying, hey, I don't really know enough, he's like, you don't have to know enough, you have to know me. You have to know me. You have to know the source of wisdom. You don't have to be all wise. You have to know the one who is all wise. And so God, God's given him his best. He's saying, I'm gonna let you know my name personally. I want you to know what's true about my character, for the, for what's been true about the last 80 years of your life and what's gonna be true about the next 40 years about your life, what's gonna be consistent about me for all eternity. 
And a part of this is, is exciting to see his interaction with God, but I fear sometimes what happens when, when we get excited about a message is we're like, okay, what I'm gonna go do is I'm gonna be go, go become a good Bible scholar. I'm gonna go study my Bible a bunch. And I would never, ever wanna discourage people from studying their Bible because it's God's word and it is where we find truth and wisdom. But there, there is a part of Bible study if it's void from a transformed life, if it's void from loving other people, we, we miss the mark. The, the source of wisdom, the, the trans, transformed life of receiving God and his wisdom Right? That's what Moses wrote. Teach us to number our days so we may gain a heart of wisdom. He's talking about a life close to God where, where he's the source. You're teaching me, God. Keep teaching me. I'll, I'll live a wise life when I'm connected to you, when you define and direct my life. So you think maybe these two things would be enough to convince Moses, right? Actually, it goes on for a few more verses and, and through verses 16 through 22, and God's like, this is how I'm gonna do it. It's gonna happen this way and this way. But Moses still is not convinced. We get over to chapter four, verse one, and Moses answers, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? And then the Lord answered him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. And the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. I'd be like, no way. Uh, but Moses reached out and he took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. And there's a few more uh, uh, examples, but basically what ends up happening is God gives him these signs. But it all starts with this question of what if? What if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? What, what, if, what if I'm not convincing and, and that what if question or all the what if questions are what happen when we're so awkwardly aware of the things that we just don't have. The, the reasons that people shouldn't take us seriously or we look at other people, we compare ourselves and we envy what that person has or what that person has. And we're like, it, it just makes more sense. They have more influence than me. They have more resources or they have the better relationships or they have more credibility or just their status or their power to make things happen. And what God does is he says, I will give you influence. And, and he gives them three different signs, not to mention the fact that we're gonna get to all these, these plagues that happen. He does even more signs than just these three. But he gives them all these signs to say, people will listen to you because it's my influence, not yours. In our church planning journey, um, I felt like there was so much that was like starting over. And, and one of the most self-focused things that I was afraid of losing was my influence. We had, we had spent eight years in Akron and we had invested in that community. We were at a pretty big church. And one of the main reasons when we were first considering coming to Columbus to church plant, we were like, this doesn't make sense because all of our influence is in Akron. I remember me and my wife, Sarah, were driving back to Akron after first visiting movement. And we were like, this just doesn't make sense. All of our influence is there. And as we began to, to get clarity that actually we, we were supposed to be in Columbus, that was a hard thing to work through, right? Like here I'm giving up all, all, all this influence. How's it gonna work, God? Like I don't know people. I don't have the resources. I, I don't know how, the answer to this. And what's been amazing is how God fills in the gap for all the ways that you can't make something possible. And, and yeah, it's, it's a ton of faith and you're like, it would be way more comfortable. It, it makes way more sense to me to just have all the influence there. And there's just been something about seeing God show up with financial resources or people to let us stay in their home or this is where you're supposed to be. I'll, I'll open the door here. Or here's new friends. Here's community for you. Here's people who need to know about Jesus. Here's, here is people who love your kids. Here's a school for them. Like how just everything starts to fall into place. Not that it's perfect, but like it, how little my influence actually matters. God's just like, say yes, humble yourself a whole bunch. And, and that's a part of his calling is like, it, it doesn't make sense to us because we're like, it, it makes way more sense where I have capability and influence, God. And there's nothing wrong with, with planning and weighing those things. We planned and weighed those things for two years. But the problem becomes when the call is obvious, but we won't step into it because the what ifs intimidate us. The last fear that Moses has, verses 10 through 12 in chapter four. He sa it says, Moses said to the Lord, 
uh, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since uh, you have spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. So Moses has a big limitation. He has a wound. He has a limp. Okay, he, he's not articulate. I don't know how you grow up in the royal Egyptian household and not learn like how, you know, you probably had training. He should have been good at speaking. Maybe he was in like eighth grade and got made fun of. And they're like, you have a lisp. And I don't know, it's like Moses' childhood wound. He's like confiding in God. He's like, this is my childhood wound. Like, I can't speak well. And uh, it's just, it, he's like, I can't overcome it. It's my, it's my limp. And, and why I can't uh, uh, overcome the, this calling that you're giving me. I can't overcome it in the calling you're giving me. And maybe you're not even certain what something like this might look in your life, like what your calling is. But I believe that when God starts to do something like this, a part of the preparation he does is heal woundedness. Part of our calling involves some counseling. And I remember showing up to counseling and starting to express some of our fears and our frustrations and just our wounds and that counselor was so gracious. They were like, man, it's clear that God's doing something in your life, that he's possibly preparing you for something. I don't really know what that thing is he's preparing you for yet, which I'll never forget what she said. She said, I think what's most important right now is not knowing what he's preparing you for, but that you learn to hear him. And we do some healing work. The, the parts of that woundedness where, where you feel like you can't trust God or you can't forgive people, I think working on that's gonna be more important than, than mapping out your life. And so that's what we did for a year. We did some incredible work of just in that waiting time of learning how to discern what God's voice sounded like again, how to forgive and, and better relate to people. And I think over time, Moses came to experience the same thing, that that healing work that God did in his life was probably one of the most beautiful things God told Moses, who, who makes a person's mouth? I will instruct you in what to say. That, that means that he would have to hear from God regularly. So is it better to just avoid your wounds and avoid your limp? Or would it be better and more amazing to see how God might heal them and overcome them in ways you, didn't, you, you just can't heal them or overcome them? The last thing Moses says isn't really a fear. He says this in verse 13. He just says, send, send anyone else. <laughs> it's just like, dude, okay, you've given like four excuses to God and he's like out of good excuses. He's just like, just send anyone else. And it, it's laughable. And he's just at, at this point where he's showing how insecure he is. Moses was clearly being prepared even before he knew it he was clearly being prepared to help rescue Israel. But do you see how God first had to rescue him? It actually upsets God. It's, it's the first time God gets angry in the Bible when he's like <laughs> Moses on his, his fourth you know, pushback. And God does send his brother with him and the rest of the story, it doesn't work out super well. But I think we can relate to these, right? If, if, if you were one of those people who raised your hand or maybe you're like, I kind of want to raise my hand, but like all this stuff's going on inside me. I, I, I'm not good enough. I've kind of lost who I am. I don't know enough. I don't, have, I don't have the wisdom that others have. I don't have influence. I got all these what ifs. I'm not good with words. I still got a wound or a limp. I think we learn something about the human heart as we look at Moses' story and as we, we see how he interacts with God, because the reality is, is God's still calling people. He's not, he's not just doing it in my life. I saw other hands go up in the room. And here's what I would want us to know, that Jesus calls us in the same way. You, you can find all these responses that God is giving to Moses, and, and you can find ways that Jesus speaks to his disciples in those ways. I'll be with you in Matthew 28, he says, I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. 
In Acts 4, as some of the early disciples are living out the Jesus way, it says that people were astonished by them because they were unschooled, ordinary men, but they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Jesus wants to be with you. He says, I want you to know me. One of his first calls to the disciples is, come follow me and I will make you into fishers of people, right? Come, come follow me, I want you to know me. He, he says uh, in John 10, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me. He wants to be known. He says, I'll give you influence, right? And that same commission that I'll be with you always to the end of the age, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so now go and make disciples. In Acts 1.8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses all throughout the world. Like I'm your influence, it's called the Holy Spirit. He says, I will help you speak, I'll help you overcome your wounds. As he talks with a blind man, he says, what is it you want me to do for you? And he says, Jesus, I wanna be able to see, and he heals him. Or in, in Matthew 10, where he's sending his disciples out for the first time, and he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Don't be worried about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it won't be you who's speaking. It'll be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Like Jesus is God speaking these things into your calling. It's just all there. Just this week, I was reminded during, during our, our group, we were having dinner and someone asked a great question. We were, we were discussing prayer. And uh, our friend, he, he said, hey, I just wonder, has there ever been a time when God felt really near to you or you heard from him? And a lot of people shared, it was super encouraging. And I shared about a time where I felt really lousy as a spiritual leader. I felt like I was failing in my calling, both at my home, with the people in my life where, where I was leading in, in our church. And I remember taking an evening just to spend time with God and kind of confess my brokenness and ask for help. And honestly, I felt like maybe I should just give up on trying so hard to, to live out this calling. Um, and I remember hearing from God, like it was like, it was a hearing from God moment, right? And what I felt spoken over me was just, I know who I've called. That, that was it, just like, hey, dude, you're like all worried about you, but I know who I called. And I felt like God started to remind me, even though there's all these parts in my own story where there's been mistakes or felt inadequate or not good enough, or I, I can't do this, this is a wound, it was almost like, he, he's like, yeah, I see all that. I, I know that you're afraid and ashamed of all that, but I know who I called and I'm gonna go with you into everything else I call you to do. <laughs> that's, that's the big idea, our takeaway, is that God knows who he is calling and he goes with those he's calling. I'll, I'll tell you the same thing I, that counselor told me. I don't, I don't know what God's gonna do in your life. But he, when he calls you, he, he knows. There's no secrets. And he promises to go with you. I think it's so important that we learn to know what God sounds like. That, that we learn to stop and pay attention. That we have friends and peers and other spiritual leaders who will help us discern God's wisdom, his voice, and that you would honestly identify your fears and, and bring them to God and let him speak into them. I, the worst thing would be is if you think that God only calls Moses and church planners. <laughs> he, he may be calling you to be more caring and proactive toward your neighbors and coworkers. He may be calling you to, to lead a group or a Bible study and, and share Jesus, Jesus with friends that only you can reach. He might call you to step back from your job or start your own business or be a stay-at-home mom. He might call you to move back home and take care of your aging parents or to get a degree or to meet a need in the community that you have a personal investment in to, to foster or, or adopt kids, 
to, to be a more generous person or to, to seek help for an addiction or a trauma you've experienced. It, it, the point is that it'll be clear when it's from God and he'll go with you in it. I wanna invite the band out, but give us some space to pray and process this. But Father, we just come to you and I just want us each to maybe admit where we're at, where we maybe feel like we know what this is. Your calling seemed clear and evident, or maybe we're just like really confused and maybe in a little disbelief that this even applies to us. God, I believe that you want us to know you and to hear you. So I just ask that you would help each person to come to a place of encounter with you whether today or, or later this week, God, would you just begin working, especially, God, to speak into the places of fear and woundedness that we might uh, be stuck in? Would we see you work in ways that are only explainable because of who you are? And would you give us courage and even joy to step into the callings you give? I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.